All right, so this is the control room. The control room controls the studio. The control room controls the studio. Uh, many control rooms are designed to control more than one studio because they actually are a very significant investment in terms of the equipment, the electronics, the wiring, the engineering. It's a big deal uh, to put together a control room. So uh, don't be surprised, especially if you're working uh, in uh, a larger facility, say in a city, uh, you might have a control room that has the ability to control more than one studio. So, for example, what you might have is a studio set up on the 12th floor, uh, and then another studio set up on the 10th floor, and then the control room is somewhere, you know, in the building as well, and they can just switch it. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, this control room, uh, in order for you to understand what I'm about to do, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it from the left to the right. And so try to create a mental image for yourself of this room from left to right. Now in the studio I talked about all the stuff and then I talked about the people. In here I'm going to be doing it all at the same time from left to right. Okay? Yes, no blank? All right, cool. Um, all right, beginning with this particular console. Uh, this is the lighting board or the lighting console. This is the lighting board or the lighting console. Lighting board, lighting console. Uh, the lighting board, uh, essentially, if you can do this, you can operate that. Okay, it is a computerized on-off switch. It's a computerized on-off switch for every single circuit in the grid. Does that make sense? Uh, and it's a computer, so it can remember multiple, multiple lighting setups. Does that make sense? So once you have a particular lighting setup established, you can save it and then simply recall it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. Uh, but it is actually really pretty easy to use. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, let's say, turn on a light out in the studio, uh, let's go ahead and clear it out. If you wanted to pick a circuit out in the studio, so I'm going to shut off the overheads in the studio. Let's say we want to turn on circuit number 16 channel 16 at full and then you can see out there that the lighting instrument, the Fresnel, uh, that is plugged into circuit 16, it's turned on. All right. Now the neat thing about a lighting board though is that I can adjust the amount of power being fed to that light in any increment between 0% and 100%. Does that make sense? down to individual percentages. So I could set it at 19%, 20%, 21%, 22%, whatever I need. How many of you have a, uh, a light at home that's on a dimmer, like a little dial or something, right? And you can make it dim and you can make it brighter. It's the same kind of thing. Do you follow me? But again, since it's a computer, if I set this one at 50% and I set another one at 21 and another one at 100, it'll remember where you left them. Does that make sense? The other thing about lighting boards that you ought to know, lighting boards come to us from the theater world. All right, so some of the terminology that you might run into, scene one, scene two, scene three, stage left, stage right, it's just coming from the theater world. Rather than build a whole new unit for film, rather than build a whole new unit for rock and roll or a whole new unit for television production, they just use the same units for all these different things. So don't be surprised if you were at a, uh, a concert up at, uh, you know, over in Hartford or you were at a theatrical production, you would probably see something very similar to this. Lighting boards, 
normally are not located in the control room itself. Uh, often the lighting boards are located in the studio. Okay. Often the lighting boards uh, might be located in an adjacent room, neither in, uh, not in the studio, not in the control room, but just in an adjacent room nearby. It really depends on how they designed your facility uh, and where the electrical connections wound up. Do you follow that idea? Um, so that's the lighting board. Now, normally you don't have someone sitting here during a production. All right. If you really think about TV, you come in, you turn on the lights, you do the show, the show's over, you shut the lights off and you go home. So you really only need someone who knows how to turn it on and turn it off. Does that make sense? You're not going to have a whole lot of lighting changes in the middle of a newscast. There's no special effects, right? You just kind of turn them on, you do the show, and then when you're done, you shut them off. Um, now, there are situations where you would have someone actually sitting here. It could be a lighting technician, uh, it could be a member of the gaffing crew, uh, you know, but it's a dedicated person to operate the lighting board. Now this would be for a TV show where you have lighting changes. Think about game shows. Game shows tend to have a lot of blinky lights, right? And so I'm thinking of who wants to be a millionaire, right? All the different lasers. Bada 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 bing, bada 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 bing. Well, the laser, you have to have someone moving the lasers around. Does that make sense? On cue, so you'd have to have someone here. But for uh, talk shows, for news programs, most of your basic stuff, if you don't have any lighting changes, you don't need to have a person here. Does that make sense? So uh, the other thing I'll tell you is this. Uh, this computer is actually hooked into the power packs, which are located way back uh, in the scene dock. So there's, <laughs> I guess the easy way to put it is this. There's not 400 amps of electricity running through this. So this board is a very safe thing to work with. You shouldn't be afraid of it thinking, oh, there's a lot of electricity running through there. No, all the electricity is in the back. Does that make sense? Some of the older lighting boards that I used to work with, yes, indeed, all 400 amps were actually flowing through your control panels. And so you had to be very, very careful when you were in the studio, and you had to be careful even touching the, uh, the lighting board. Make sense? All right. The next position over this particular computer, this is the teleprompter. T-E-L-E-P-R-O-M-P-T-E-R. T-E-L-E-P-R-O-M-P-T-E-R. P T E R, teleprompter computer. Uh, the technician that'll be operating this is normally not a production technician or a production assistant. The person that's operating this is normally a member of the producing staff. So we need to kind of stop here and take a second and go, okay, when you hear the word producer, the first thing that should pop into your head is writer. A producer is a writer. And producers come in lots of different flavors. There's assistant producers, associate producers, executive producers. A producer is a writer. And so more often than not, the person that's going to be operating this uh, is what we call a line producer because they are on the line. Does that make sense? They're a line producer. Uh, you, uh, but a teleprompter computer uh, is essentially script management. It's script management. Uh, how many of you have ever made a document in Microsoft Word? Ever. Well, the teleprompter computer is about 500% easier. It's more like text edit. Does that make sense? I mean, it's really, really basic. Uh, but what it does is it turns a document, your script, hello, my name is Andrew Utterback, and welcome to today's program. It turns a script into a scrollable file 
Sort of like turning a document into a PDF. That's a good way to think about it. Does that make sense? So uh, that's what it primarily does. Now since it's a computer, you can sit right here and you can type your script into the computer. Hello, my name is Andrew Rutterback and welcome to today's program. But you can also import scripts from anywhere. So you might have a reporter that's in Hartford and they could email you the script, makes sense, and you would simply load it in. You could even have a reporter uh, in Australia <laughs> and they can email you the script and then you would load it in. Does that make sense? So uh, in that sense of the word, it's a very flexible uh, scripting uh, unit, but what you need to know is that uh, more common, more common and pretty much ubiquitous now, newsroom control software, newsroom control software, all right, newsroom control software combines scripting, it combines scripting with what we call rundowns, rundowns are outlines of the show, all right, but it also connects with all of your other media assets that might be used in your show. And so these software packages are much, much more powerful than basic teleprompting units, okay? Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, there's a company called Avid uh, that originally started off as a nonlinear video editing uh, software package kind of a thing. But Avid has a suite of software uh, that was originally called iNews, iNews, and iNews uh, combines video assets, audio assets, it treats a script as simply another media asset, and it simply combines it all into one nice software package so that the line producer can add things on the go, take things away on the go, whatever is needed, all right? So it's essentially, this newsroom control software is media asset management software, all right? And besides Avid iNews, uh, the Associated Press came out with their own version. It's called ENPS, uh, ENPS. Uh, there's a European software package, uh, it's very common in Western Europe, called Octopus. And so, if you got a job at a local TV station, one of the things that you would have to figure out is, okay, are they using newsroom control software? And the answer is, well, probably yes. And then which one are they using? And you'd have to learn it. Okay, you'd have to learn it. Uh, and each one is slightly different, but they're very similar. How many of you can surf the internet using Safari? Have you ever used Safari? Well, I bet you can sort of surf the internet using maybe Google Chrome, right? Because it's really not all that different, is it? Right, so the difference between iNews, ENPS, and Octopus, <laughs> it all does the same thing. You just have to figure out where they put the button, all right? So the person that gets assigned here is typically going to be a line producer, but often we just call that person prompter. So you lose your name and you are identified by what, by what you are doing. So it would sound something like this. Hey, who's on prompter tonight? I am. Where's prompter? Oh, prompter had to go to the bathroom or whatever. All right. Does that make sense? They'll be right back. Who's that? Hey, prompter, come here. Make sense? Questions about prompter? All right. Let's continue. The next thing over, this is an audio board or audio console. An audio board or audio console. Audio board or audio console. The audio board, uh, quite simply, is an audio selection device. An audio selection device. Uh, there's no video running through it. Uh, you can jump up on, jump up and down on it all day, and you will not affect video. It's just audio. All right. Uh, the person who operates it is your A1, uh, otherwise known as audio. So the person that's operating it is called audio, 
and that person would be your A1, your lead audio person. Remember when I talked about sometimes you have an audio assistant in the studio and that person is called the A2. Make sense? That's the difference. Um, audio boards are really not all that expensive. In the grand scheme of things, uh, they're really not that expensive. You can actually get really high quality digital audio boards for less than 5,000 um, bucks. But let's talk about what it does. Audio boards have wired into it all of your audio sources. So your audio sources are all connected, your audio sources are connected to your audio board. What might some of these audio sources be? Give me an example of an audio source. A microphone, yeah. Okay, so out in the studio, you have microphones hooked up on your anchors, right? Your meteorologist, your sports anchor, uh, if you have a guest or whatever. So you might have, I don't know, typically five, six microphones running around out there. Well, each one of those microphones is an audio source, an audio source, and each one is wired into, connected into your audio board. You follow that idea? What else is audio besides the microphones? Yeah? Uh, preset song sound effects. Okay, yeah. So if you have music, if you have music or sound effects or something like that, that music or those sound effects have to come from a machine, right? So Rather than thinking about content, music, theme song, sound effect, you need to think machine. What machine actually has the music in it? All right, and I'll give you a really cheesy example. A CD player, right? A CD player. A CD player is an audio source. A CD player is an audio source. What's on that CD might be the theme music, right? To Jeopardy, maybe. Do, 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 do. It's got to come from somewhere. Well, it might be coming from a CD player, right? Or uh, Wheel of Fortune, bing! Vanna White goes like this. All right, well, you have to have that bing sound come from somewhere. All right? So, Pre-recorded music or sound effects could be coming from a CD player, but where else could they be coming from? Could it come off of an iPod? Sure. Could it come off of uh, an audio server? An audio server? How many of you mess around with iTunes? iTunes essentially turns your personal computer into an audio server. Right? It serves audio files to you on demand. Right? Make sense? So don't think about content, music, sound effect, or theme music or what have you. Think about what machine is it coming from. All right? Now what else is wired in there? What other types of machines might be wired in? No, cameras don't generate audio. Is there like mics on board? Well, s field cameras will have onboard mics. Studio cameras don't. Monitors. Monitors don't generate speakers don't generate audio. They allow you they allow you to listen to it, right? They allow you to hear it. Okay, you've got some pre-recorded footage of Serena Williams beating Venus yesterday. Okay, so in your sports section of your newscast, you're going to show some footage of Serena and Venus playing tennis, right? Is there audio with that? Them grunting. What? Them grunting. Yeah, the grunting typically. <laughs> whack, whack, <laughs> right? Well, that audio. The audio is coming from a playback device 
that also is playing back video, right? So a playback device is not only playing back video, it's playing back audio at the same time. The audio is stripped off and routed to your audio board. So it is controlled separately from the video. Does that make sense? So what are some of these playback devices? Well, a playback device might be a, uh, a video server. A video server. So just like iTunes, but it's all video. <laughs> well, YouTube could be a playback source, yes. Uh, but YouTube, uh, the quality of the video is very, very low. And so we wouldn't really use that frequently <laughs> unless there was something on YouTube that we just had to show everybody. Does that make sense? So let's think about playback devices for video. Well, VTRs, digital VTRs. All right, how many of you had a VCR or even remember what a VCR looks like? Well, yeah, digital videotape. Digital videotape would be played back from a VTR, all right? It's a digital VTR, but it's still a VTR. Videotape recorder, all right? We also have DDRs, DDRs, digital disc recorders, digital disc recorders. Could we also do it off of a DVD? Yeah, we could do it off of a DVD. Does that make sense? But again, what you need to remember is that the playback device, the audio from the playback device, is stripped off and it is a source in your audio control. All right, now, I'm live in Afghanistan. Here I am, I'm live in Afghanistan. I'm speaking into a microphone, but the audio off of that microphone is being encoded and shot through outer space off of a satellite, satellite and bounced back into New York, right? So my audio source is not a mic, it's not gonna say microphone, it's gonna say satellite. Does that make sense? It's the audio coming from the satellite. Do you follow me? Now, how many of you have ever seen any of those little trucks running around, it says Fox News or CBS or whatever on the side, and there's a pole sticking up out of the top, a little pole with a little itty bitty, looks like a satellite dish, but it's not like a little dish on top. Those are called microwave trucks. So those are used for local remotes usually no more than like say 30 miles okay it depends on the terrain because it's line of sight but let's say you have a reporter who is live in downtown Hartford here I am I'm live in downtown Hartford where something just happened and I'm speaking into a microphone the audio is going into the microphone but it's being shot back to the station through the microwave system and so what would you see the audio from the microwave truck would be wired in. Do you follow me on that idea? Sort of, kind of? All right, so uh, another word about audio boards, besides all these different audio sources, um, audio boards usually are not located on the front line like this. All right, normally what you would see is that an audio board would be isolated in an audio booth or audio room of some kind. And so uh, don't, don't be surprised if you walk into a control room, you might see a little door down at the end of the control room. And if you open that door, there's a, an audio room that's isolated but adjacent to the main control room. Or you might have a control room that's done up in rows you might have two or three rows, and the audio board would be way in the back. Why would we want the audio board sort of away from the front? Why would you want that? Because I gotta listen to everything, and there's people talking, it's distracting. Exactly. So, whoever's operating the audio board, do you think they want some peace and quiet so they can actually listen to what's going on? Do you think the front row of a control room during a live production can be sort of noisy and loud? 
with people doing stuff, yelling commands and moving around. Yeah. Um, but here at Eastern, we had to put our audio board where it is because the wall behind you is a weight retaining wall. And if I take that wall down, the whole building falls down. So that would be bad, okay? So that's why it's there. Uh, any questions on the audio board? Yeah. Does that have like a limit how much stuff different sources could be on it? Could well, the interesting thing about audio boards uh, is that, yeah, you buy them. When you buy them, you buy them with a certain number of inputs, okay? And so, as you might imagine, uh, the more inputs you have, the more expensive your audio board will be, okay? But in the land of digital, you're really just, you can duplicate software instantly, right? So in the land of digital, being able to have multiple, multiple inputs, it doesn't really add that much cost. But if you look at the physical board itself, if you look at the physical board itself, this is what costs you money, or the input, the actual physical inputs. Have you ever seen an audio board bigger than that? Like on TV? You see, you see sometimes, you know, like you'll be watching a music video or something, uh, and they'll show you the audio board, and the audio board is like ginormous, and it's like from here to the wall. Well, what does that mean? Well, number one, it's pretty expensive, but number two, it's an audio board that can handle what? Hundreds, hundreds of inputs. Does that make sense? Hundreds of inputs, as opposed to 8, 16, 32, 64, blah, blah, blah. Make sense? Yeah. Um, they're pretty much the same, but, but, audio in television is low process audio. We don't spend a whole lot of time messing with the equalizers or applying special effects. Uh, it's essentially garbage in, garbage out, okay? Uh, whereas in radio, you spend a bit more time with the audio processing. You'll be doing more equalization uh, and you'll be applying special effects and things to really make the audio sound as good as possible because that's what it's all about. Make sense? Yep. And in sound recording, let's say you're doing Taylor Swift's newest album. In sound recording, are you going to be doing a lot of processing? Oh, you're going to be doing tons and tons and tons of processing. But if you're just doing a newscast, you're not going to be spending a whole lot of time applying uh, equalization or other types of special effects uh, because it's just, as I said, garbage in, garbage out. All right, and that's why most news anchors come with a perfect voice already. You don't need to apply any equalization. Make sense? They already sound great. Uh, other questions about the audio board? Yeah. Is it, I don't know like, what happens with commercials. Is that like out of, your, out of like, the TV uh, program's hands, so, like when commercials go on, or do you control volume of commercials? Well, uh, it's pretty rare to actually run the commercials from the control room. I've seen it done, but it's pretty rare. Normally, the commercials are being controlled by another place in the TV station called Master Control. Master Control uh, controls the output of the TV station. And so they have different sources, satellite, microwave, network, which is coming in off the satellite, the TV studio. And so they're selecting different sources. And the ads, the advertising is typically going to be, the local advertising will be in master control. The national advertising might be coming in off satellite. Uh, but even then, it would probably be all loaded onto a video server. It's all pounded into a playlist. And they just fire them off as needed. Uh, but yeah, like in uh, the local Connecticut market, you guys are probably familiar with Bob's discount furniture, right? You know, Bob's discount furniture. 
there's ads you can't get away from them. Well, those are local ads that were um, purchased, right? Um, those were local ads, and uh, you know those are going to be in master control in the TV station, okay? And more than likely, they're in digital form, just loaded onto a server. Uh, by the way, this is an audio board. It's not a mixer. A mixer is portable. A mixer is portable. So that is an audio board or audio console. It is not a mixer. Don't call it a mixer. Although they look the same and they do pretty much the same thing, a mixer is a portable device. All right. The next thing over, the heart of the control room, the next thing over, the thing with all the buttons on it, go ahead and press the button, press one, just pick one. Look at that, Ooh, they all light up, and they're different colors. Uh, that thing is the video switcher. That thing is the video switcher. The video switcher is a video selection device. The video switcher is a video selection device, okay? It is operated by a technician called the technical director or TD. It's operated by a technician called the technical director or TD. The video switcher is a video selection device. It's operated by a technician called the TD, technical director. So, uh, what are some of the video sources that are wired in? Let's think about video sources. Yeah. Camera. Yeah, bingo. You've got your three cameras out in the studio. Each one is feeding a line of video to the video switcher. Right? Camera one, camera two, camera three. What else is video? VCR. Okay, yeah. All of your playback devices. Each playback device generates its own line of video, okay? So if you had two DDRs, you'd have one line of video coming off the first one and another line of video coming off the second one. Does that make sense? A video server is generating a line of video, although some video servers can generate more than one, okay, which is kind of cool. You're going to pay extra for that. All right. A DVD player is going to generate a line of video. Here I am, I'm live in Afghanistan and I'm looking into a camera. The video signal on that camera is being encoded and shot through outer space off of a satellite. Bingo. So the satellite is generating a line of video. Uh, here I am live in downtown Hartford where something just happened. It's very important that I be in downtown Hartford right now. I'm not sure why. I'm looking into a camera. The video signal is being shot back to the station through the microwave truck. All right, so the microwave system is generating a line of video, right? What else is video? What else? What else is video? What about graphics? Is graphics video? Yes. <laughs> graphics is video. Uh, graphics are video. Um, so your graphics computers, your graphics computers, depending on how many you have, your graphics computers are going to be generating video that is hooked into the video switcher. Uh, the neat thing about the video switcher, though, is that it can generate its own video. It can generate its own video. So it can generate all kinds of color backgrounds. It can generate all kinds of color backgrounds and color washes and things like that. But it can also, uh, this particular video switcher has an embedded image store, an embedded image store, uh, which is essentially, uh, it's flash memory, it's non-volatile memory uh, that holds just a whole ton of still images in very high resolution. All right, so let's say you need a, pr a picture of President Obama, right? Well, it's in there. Do you need a picture of the American flag? It's 
probably in there. You need a picture of Governor Malloy? It's in there, makes sense. So some video switchers have embedded image stores, some don't. It depends on how much you spent. Makes sense. Some video switchers have uh, the ability to play back very short uh, embedded video clips. Short ones though, short ones. Um, because uh, video uh, tends to be uh, uh, a memory eater, all right, especially if it's uncompressed. Uh, video, if it's uncompressed, can be as high as 128 megs a second. That'll fill up a hard drive pretty quick, right? <laughs> so, uh, but video switchers uh, are really fun. Uh, they really are fun, but again, they're a video selection device. Uh, it's probably the most expensive thing in here. Uh, many video switchers are north of 150,000 depending on what kinds of modules you purchased with it. Uh, and don't be surprised, there are some that actually go higher than that. Uh, easily up to a half a million. Uh, ours is actually, um, you know, it's not a Honda Accord. That thing is a Ferrari. That's exactly what you would see if you walked into any professional facility uh, it's what you would see at a place like ESPN. Uh, that one's a Grass Valley Carrera uh, with a touch screen control. Uh, it's only a, a 2ME switcher, uh, and we'll get into that when we actually talk about the switcher itself. Okay. All right, the next uh, position down, and I'm going to walk down here. Uh, the next position down is another computer labeled Chiron. Labeled Chiron. Uh, this thing is a graphics computer. This is a graphics computer, okay? This is a graphics computer. Uh, and the graphics computer is operated by a person called graphics. The graphics computer is operated by a technician called graphics. Uh, the graphics computer can operate in a number of different modes, all right? The first mode of the graphics computer is CG character generation, character generator, uh, CG. It's a character generator, which means that you can type words. Those words will be turned into video, and then you can look at them. All right, now nine times out of 10, you're typing somebody's name. Andrew Utterback, associate professor, Eastern Connecticut State University. You have an image of me, and then you wanna pop up my name, right? Well, my name, is coming from the graphics computer in essentially CG mode and it pops up over my image and then it goes away. Have you ever seen that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, it might be sports scores, it might be the weather forecast, it, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that that thing can do uh, in, in CG mode. It is also an image store. It's also an image store. So. The graphics computer can operate in what we used to call ESS mode, electronic still store. Image store, electronic still store, it means the same thing. The graphics computer has the ability to hold a lot of high resolution still images. Now, of course, as you might imagine, you can combine things, right? You pull up an image of Obama, and then you can put his name over top of that, and then save the whole thing as a new file. Make sense? It's very basic, actually. Um, the graphics computer can also generate 2D animations. It can generate 2D animations. It can also generate 3D animations. 3D animations. Uh, just the other day, I decided to create the planet Earth in 3D and make it turn and fly it around and resize it. Uh, it took me about 45 seconds and it's real-time processing, all right? So one of the things about graphics computers is that they are very, very powerful because they're processing this stuff and showing it to you real-time. There, there's no rendering. There's no spinning wheel of death, all right? It actually does it real-time. Uh, all right, the next position over right here, the next position over, uh, that's an engineering station. That's engineering. Yeah, right there. 
under the clock, under the clock, that's engineering. And the three little uh, pieces of equipment there, those are CCUs, camera control units. Camera control units. We have three cameras. How many CCUs do we have? Three. Three. Camera control units. Uh, the camera control units um, control the cameras. <laughs> uh, they supply power to the cameras, but they also adjust how the cameras see. All right? Each camera has to be seeing color in exactly the same way. Otherwise, if I change from camera one to camera two, the color of your shirt would change, right? Camera one, camera two, and camera three have to be seeing color exactly the same way at the electromagnetic level. Does that make sense? And so we have to be able to look at the video signal on the electromagnetic level. So very close by to engineering, what you'll see up there, there's a waveform and a vector scope, that gray thing. That allows us to look at a video signal on the electromagnetic level. So let me pop uh, color bars in there. Oh, this thing's not happy right now. So that's not going to work. Bummer. Something's up. Need to reset the board. But if I popped color bars in there, what you would see is the waveform. You would actually be able to see the actual video. I'll show that to you when I can get it set up another time. Um, but that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a video signal. Do you see the wave there? Kind of interesting. Uh, so the CCUs. Uh, with the waveform and the vector scope, that allows us to adjust how the cameras see red, green, blue, black, and white. By combining red, green, blue, black, and white, you get all the other colors. So I make sure that each camera is looking at red, green, blue, black, and white exactly the same way, and then I'm good. Make sense? Imagine what it's like trying to balance 26 cameras. So that they are, they're all looking at, you know, exactly the same way. Well, that's what you have at a giant, say, an NFL football game. All the cameras have to be looking at color exactly the same. It's a big job just to get set up, right? Uh, yeah, question. So, um, we can only control three cameras. Like, what if we needed a fourth camera? Do we have to get a whole new thing? When you buy the camera, it comes with uh, okay. your CCU. It comes with a CCU. Um, so the person who works there is called a broadcast engineer. The person who works there is called a broadcast engineer. All right. Uh, normally, they are not in the control room during the show, although sometimes you might have a member of the engineering staff in here shading cameras or something like that. Riding iris is what we call it, um, or shading. Uh, the broadcast engineer typically is uh, a staff member who works for the TV station, all right, who works for the TV station. Uh, many TV operations have more than one broadcast engineer uh, working for them. So, for example, uh, over at ESPN, there are teams of broadcast engineers that work over there. Um, uh, you know, but it's a really interesting career that you can have. It takes about another two years after your bachelor's degree. Uh, you go through an apprenticeship program and that kind of a thing. Uh, there's an alum uh, from Eastern who uh, did just that, and now he's an engineer for Major League Baseball and NFL, uh, running around setting up satellite trucks and that kind of stuff. That's what he does for a living, and they fly him wherever he needs to go. Uh, so he became a broadcast engineer. Now we are really lucky here at Eastern because we actually have a broadcast engineer on staff. That's kind of rare. We actually have a real broadcast engineer on staff. His name's Paul uh, Melmer and if you stay in the program long enough you guys will get to meet Paul. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge and he is my co-advisor for the ETV group. All right. The next thing over 
uh, beyond engineering there, that's playback. That's playback, playback, playback. And so what you see over there, you see some VTRs. You see some VTRs. Those are digital VTRs. Uh, there's a couple DVD players in there. Uh, the unit that just has the two slots there, these are DDRs right here. That gray thing, that's a DDR. These little monitors you, right here? No, underneath the monitors. Oh, this stuff yeah, there's, oh. those are cartridges yeah. uh, for your DDR. Actually, I think there's a DDR cartridge. Yeah, excuse me a second. This is a DDR cartridge. How many of you have chips that you put in your cameras? Yeah, well, that's what are, it looks like when you get to broadcasting. <laughs> okay. Extreme Pro <laughs> SanDisk. I forget how, how many. This one is a 240 gigabyte uh, flash drive. 240 gigs. Um, but again, that's a DDR, digital disc recorder. Uh, playback is where any pre-recorded material that you need is going to be handled. So your footage of Serena and Venus playing tennis, right? That video clip, that pre-recorded video clip would be handled out of playback. Does that make sense? Uh, in a live newscast, you would expect to have about uh, uh, a clip every minute. So a 30-minute newscast, you'd have 30 separate clips that you would have to deal with. Um, also, the other job of the playback uh, position, the other job of the playback position is to record the show. Don't forget to record the show. Oh, I'm sorry, Oprah, we forgot to record the show. But Lance Armstrong just confessed. Oh, sorry, do it again. <laughs> You're fired. Um, so, don't forget to record the show. Don't forget to record the show. But that's where you're going to be handling your playback. Okay, that's playback. Some other jobs that you have in the control room that aren't associated really with a particular piece of equipment, uh, you will have an assistant director. An assistant director. Uh, the assistant director's job is timing. Timing. It's all about timing. So, uh, assistant directors time the show forwards and backwards. They also uh, time pre-recorded video clips. They also time things like graphics inserts. Uh, assistant directors can tell you things like this. Uh, we're 10 minutes into the show and we have 20 minutes left. And they can tell you that down to the second at any given moment. Because your TV show has to start and end exactly on time. Does that make sense? You can't be 30 minutes and 10 seconds. You can't be 30 minutes and 15 seconds. You need to be exactly 30 minutes. I mean to the nose. Question. Is that like different for sports or do they just allocate extra time to things? Like for basketball you don't go against the OT? Yeah, when you're doing live sports and you're just covering a game, they know that there's always the possibility of going over. But have you ever noticed that they tend to, as soon as the game is over, if it has gone over, how quickly they get out? That's because they need to get back onto their programming schedule. Um, yeah, so that does happen. That does happen. <clears throat> Especially when things go into overtime or double overtime or whatever, and they're, they're like, oh! Well, they, what they do in a game is they guarantee you a certain number of exposures. Okay, they will guarantee a certain number of exposures. But the bonus is, is that you might get more exposures, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say a coach calls a timeout. What do they do immediately? Commercial. They dump to a commercial. Now that is sort of like an extra exposure, right? Yeah. So hey, bonus. Make sense? Yeah, and so they'll guarantee you a certain number of exposures and then any more exposures that you get, 
Uh, sometimes they'll charge you for it, but more often than not, especially depending on who it is, it'll be free. Question? Well, no, actually, I have a response to that. I've worked on a couple of trucks for sporting events, and the AD always has the network in their ear. Mm -hmm. So the network will tell them that they're in a break zone, so there's an uncertain amount of time without a break. So they'll tell the director and the producer, hey, we're in a break zone, make sure you get a, a commercial in. Uh, so the constant contact with the network, and when they go over time, they're also talking to the network, hey, we're looking at 10 minutes and 30 seconds extra, or, or whatever. So they're kind of the eyes and ears from the director to the network. But they will, when they actually do the, the sales package, they'll say, listen, you'll get at least this number. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes you get to the end of the thing, and let's say you guaranteed five exposures, but you only made four. Well, then you're going to have to do make goods, right? You're going to have to make good in some way uh, or give them a slight refund. They'd never do that. Uh, what we'll do is we'll give you a free one on the next game. How about that? Is that cool? And we'll charge you a lot less. Um, anyhow. Uh, so you've got an assistant director in here. You will also have members of the producing staff, uh, assistant producers, associate producers. When you hear the word producer, you think writer. writer. Uh, executive producer gets thrown around in a lot of different ways. So just so that you know, uh, executive producer sometimes means the lead writer. The lead writer, all right? But sometimes executive producer means that that person has a financial investment in the show, all right? Uh, sometimes the executive producers are people, Steven Spielberg, uh, sometimes an executive producer is a company. Uh, Disney presents. Does that make sense? But they're the ones who are putting up the money to create the show, right? And they're also the ones that are going to reap the rewards of the advertising sales or what have you. Does that make sense? So sometimes executive producer means lead writer but sometimes it means the person has a financial interest in the show. But if you run into an executive producer in a local television news operation, it just means they're the lead writer. Do you follow that? And then finally, I want to talk about the director. I want to talk about the director. The director is the lead technician, the lead technician, and is in charge of the entire production staff. All right, the director is the boss of the entire production staff. The director and the producer work together to make the TV show happen. The producer is responsible for the content and the director's responsible for all the technical stuff. Does that make sense? So, in order to have a successful TV show, you need to have what? A really good producer and a really good director. You need both <coughs> in order to really have a successful show. All right? And trust me, I have worked in different situations where the director wasn't so good and the producer was awesome and the TV show was eh, right? I've also worked with a lot of really good directors, but the producer was eh, and the TV show was eh. Does that make sense? You really need both. You need both. Um, but the director's in charge of the production staff. Um, the director, uh, once the TV show begins, technically outranks everybody. All right, including the executive producer. Once the TV show begins, the director outranks everyone when the facility is live, all right? Because they have control over what the viewers at home are seeing. And so they have sort of the ultimate veto power. A producer might say, hey, can we, 
and the director can turn around and say no. <laughs> but more often than not, the director will say, well, I'll hang on a minute. <laughs> you know, I'll try. Does that make sense? Um, now, the director uses what we call the command cue language, which is a different language, uh, a peculiar language, a language all its own. Uh, the director uses the command cue language to talk to the entire production staff all at the same time. They do this using an intercom system. They do this using an intercom system. And it sounds something like this. All right, so when a director is calling a show, it sounds something like this. We're coming to camera two, talents mic in a queue in 10 seconds. Camera two, talents mic in a queue in five seconds. Stand by, fade to two, mic in queue. Uh, stand by VTRA, full track's coming on A. Roll tape A, track, and take it. Stand by, downstream and downstream. So a director is talking to everybody all at the same time, pretty much nonstop for 30 minutes or for however long the show is. Does that make sense? Uh, and it sounds like that. And so, as a member of a production, as a member of a production, uh, you know, group, knowing what the director is saying and who the director is actually talking to is going to be important, because sometimes within all that gobbledygook. The director's talking to a camera operator, the technical director, the audio person separately or all at the same time. Does that make sense? But they have to concentrate. They really have to concentrate. Directing is sort of like running in front of a train. Either you're in front of the train, leading the train down the track, or you are getting run over. So you have to really be able to keep you're cool. Makes sense. But that's why they're at the top of the food chain. You don't graduate from <laughs> college and just get put into a director's chair. That's not going to happen. It takes a while. Does that make sense? But it's possible. <clears throat> Here at Eastern, ETV, uh, it's the directors are students. The directors are students, and so uh, if you want to learn how to direct and actually do some directing, you have the opportunity to do it while you're here at Eastern. Uh, but it's not easy. Yeah? Do they, do they have like a sheet of when they know who to call at what time? How do they know what to say and when to say it? <coughs> what they have in front of them typically is a script. but. <laughs> On that script, you'll see all kinds of, I mean, it's a mess. You'll see all these marks, and they are director's marks. And what they are are little memory jogs that tell them, oh, you know, I'm on camera one for this. I go to DDRA for that. I go to satellite three for this. I go to this for that. Does that make sense? So if you looked at a director's script, You'll see these marks on it. Look in your textbook. There's actually an image that shows a very basic director's mark, and you'll see what it looks like. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that. I'll show you how to do that. But it's uh, it's kind of its own thing. But you know, that's all you have. You have the script, and you have the seat of your pants, and your. All right. Now, we've talked about all the stuff in the control room, we've talked about the people in here, but we haven't talked about the monitor wall area. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about that. Um, what you see in front of you, you see two multi-viewers. The large LCD panels are multi-viewers. And what you see there are little boxes. Each box represents a video source a video source. Uh, so you can see the cameras are in there, camera one, camera two, camera three. You see some other things uh, like even the teleprompters fed through there. The graphics computer has two buffers. They're over on the right hand side. You can see VTRB, VTRC and whatnot. The DDRs in there. Uh, so your sources are always going to appear in small monitors. 
your sources, your video sources are going to appear in small monitors, whether it's in a multi-viewer or if you look up here, you see these marshals, the little small marshals. Those are small, right? Small TV sets, small monitors rather. Video sources, make sense? Now, two medium-sized LCD panels, but larger, right there in the middle. One's labeled preview, one's labeled program. You see those? Aha, those are important. The video signal that you see in program is the video signal that is hot, live. It's the one that's being recorded. It's the video signal that everybody at home is looking at. Does that make sense? Program is showing you what is hot, live, being recorded. It's what you're looking at at home. Preview, preview is the video signal that is next. Preview is the video signal that is next. It's on deck. People at home can't see that. The only people that can see preview are in this room. Does that make sense? So what it does, preview allows us to take a look at something before we activate it to program. Does that make sense? It allows us to look at something before we make it live. All right? And that's how it works. Now, sometimes uh, preview is called preset. Sometimes preview is called preset. So if you see a, a monitor and it says preset, eh, preview, same thing. Uh, and also, don't get confused by initials. PGM means program. PST means preset. PVW means, there you go. So don't get confused by that kind of stuff. Preview, the video signal that's next or on deck program, that's what everybody's looking at. Now, uh, monitor walls get much bigger than this. How many of you have ever seen a very large monitor wall? Like, you know, say, uh, one of the biggest ones I ever saw was uh, the control room for, I think it was um, MSNBC. It was huge, <laughs> just huge. I mean, it's floor to ceiling, and CNN's probably the same way. Um, but again, the small monitors are showing you video sources, all right? They're showing you video sources. All right, questions. I have hit you with a lot of vocabulary. It's all in the book, though. It's all in the book.